start to talk about uh, or introduce Eric. Eric, I can see that you're there. That's great to see you. I must say I have been, I feel honored to be able to welcome uh, Eric as our opening keynote speaker, uh, both because he is, of course, a very well-known technology leader in the industry, uh, CTO of Ericsson, working on very important uh, topics for Ericsson as well as the Swedish industry at large, mobility, cloud, artificial intelligence, and the Internet of Things. He's been at Ericsson longer than uh, I can remember. I had to look it up in your bio. It says since 1993, Eric, so that's a long time. And the fun thing is that Eric and I actually met uh, in the time that I was working for uh, Intuit in Silicon Valley. And uh, Eric's, uh, Eric spent several years in Santa Clara at the Ericsson site there on the 237, if I'm not mistaken. And we happened to run into each other a few times uh, during that time. So I'm uh, very excited uh, to uh, op give the floor to Eric. Eric, I will be uh, your remote control today. So if I'm not mistaken, we can see your slides. And uh, I'm happy to uh, yield the floor to you. And uh, you just let me know when you want me to swap to the next slide. Absolutely. And uh, great to be with you, Jan, and uh, the whole uh, team here. Um, this is a great opportunity, I think, to uh, have a dialogue about where, where we are heading or perhaps where the industry is heading. But let me start by first congratulating on the first uh, 10 successful years. This has uh, been a fantastic achievement. And, and as you said, we met uh, many years ago. Um, I learned uh, a few things about A-B testing from that first session. And uh, I think we applied that uh, across things that we do in the design space, but also, of course, in terms of how we iteratively uh, work with, with development on products. So that has been a fantastic journey. And of course, this uh, 10 years with the Software Center has been an uh, even more rewarding collaboration from an Ericsson side. And why are we then so interested in working with you and the Software Center? Well, I think today it may be obvious, but when we started, perhaps not as obvious. Today we actually put uh, data driven as, as one of our fundamental capabilities, the foundation of Ericsson's strategy. We talk about technology leadership, we talk about scale and skill, we talk about how we build um, high performance uh, solutions. Uh, but we also talk about uh, data-driven, which means that we are building in uh, data-driven capabilities in the portfolio, products, solutions, services, and it's becoming a key, uh, key development for us. So one of your previous slides, Jan, of course, resonates very well with, with where, we, where we are. Cloud Native is, of course, the other journey that we've been on for many, many years, um, modularizing everything we do, microservices, and this is true for what we call core networks, um, basically the gateways to, to the rest of the internet, uh, the radio networks, and of course anything in between in terms of transport, orchestration, uh, enablement, exposure, all the things that allows you to build applications on top of a 4G or, or now 5G, 5G network. So what we have actually done over these, perhaps not quite 10 years, but what we've done over a number of years is to really change the industry and change our offering from being network uh, centric only to being network plus uh, capabilities to run generic applications. So we're building uh, a platform. It's getting more and more capabilities by the day, but it's also very much linking to how to support enterprises, how to support uh, those that are, are today building applications in a public cloud environment. So this uh, journey and this collaboration has been extremely important for us. But let me start by sharing a few of the things from the industry, from where we are with uh, 5G and uh, the technology evolution. Thank you. Um, end of this year, 2021, we will have more than half a billion 5G subscriptions around the world. I don't know how many of you are, are enjoying 5G service, but uh, this is actually happening more in uh, North America, uh, Northeast Asia, China, Korea, Japan. Uh, there are other countries around the world where this is actually exploding. We were at uh, around 200 million only six months ago, uh, end of 2020. So it's, it's a fantastic growth rate when it comes to um, smartphones, when it comes to network build out. And we are fortunate to actually power around half of those commercial 5G networks around the world, uh, basically everywhere in the world where you have um, regulatory conditions are there, 
where you have operators investing in 5G infrastructure and then of course a hunger both from consumers and enterprises to to move, move into to the latest technology to move into 5G. So that actually means about a million new subscriptions added every day. So it's, it's a rapid take up right now and at some point we will have 5G in Sweden as well. Um, but um, again, the, the leading countries they are well into they are in their second or or um, yeah second second year of, of deployments and rollout. Uh, an interesting fact that comes also from the last 15 months of the pandemic is that uh, we all work in in new places, work from home, work from uh, um, wherever we are, and that that is something that we believe will continue even when we are back into the hybrid mode uh, when we have vaccinations uh, taking place. And one aspect of that is that mobile is becoming a primary access for users. So fixed wireless access is really something where 5G can, can really help. It's more cost efficient to build with wireless and to, to dig fiber. Uh, it doesn't mean that we will not use the fiber network. It doesn't mean that we will not build uh, base stations that are connected to, to fiber networks, of course. But uh, most of us, and that is not only for humans, most of us see the value in, in mobility and that goes for sensors, of course IoT, uh, but it also goes for our, our new behavior when it comes to work from everywhere. And that actually means that 70% uh, of uh, the operators around the, the world are actually offering these fixed wireless uh, services. So this will grow tremendously uh, over the coming five, six years. Technology is finally ready to serve uh, gigabit per second speed, millisecond latencies, uh, basically wherever you are. Of course, it, it's a journey in terms of rollout, but but that's basically where we're heading. And the growth in terms of how much we consume is uh, equally astonishing. So 10 gigabyte is uh, is a average monthly usage. Uh, of course, if you compare to uh, fixed usage where you have your um, TV on and you have gaming going on all the day, that could, e it could easily be a factor of 10 more. But, but this is uh, individual mobile consumption. So it's, it's staggering numbers and it's going to be uh, tripled or more than tripled in the coming five years. So we have to basically rebuild the infrastructure in every new hardware and software release that we deploy. We have to cater for this traffic growth. And we couldn't do this with one size fits all because th these are different cases to build for a mobile case, to build for a fixed wireless case, to build for indoor cases, to build for super rural cases. That's mean that we have to have flexibility in, in, in the products that we're building. That means that we have to have an ability to add features and functions, of course, by software continuously, but also in major shifts when we are supporting new accelerators, for example, in the radio network or in at the edge. So these are just a, a few key key stats. Then, if you want to move to the next slide, uh, I mentioned 500 uh, or 580 million subscriptions already uh, end of this year. But if you look at 2026, that number is going to grow to three and a half billion 5G subscriptions, and that's a orange part in this uh, graph showing that there is a modest overall uptake in terms of mobile subscriptions, uh, reaching almost nine billion from eight billion today. Uh, but it's really a big shift over to the latest technology. So the green part is 4G LTE and the orange part then is, is 5G, where in, in only these five years time, we will have a very significant part of the global subscription base actually on the latest technology. And I think this is really one of the obvious um, innovation engines of society now, that if you can build on the digital infrastructure that uh, 4G was and now 5G is becoming, then you can digitalize practically anything. You can digitalize your transport, you can digitalize your ports, you can digitalize your smart uh, your manufacturing, your smart manufacturing, you can digitalize anything because this is the fastest growing technology there is. And this actually includes also the cloud industry. We are doubling capacity in, in, uh, in less than 20 months. We are uh, passing one gigabit per second speeds now for, for users and devices. And this will not stop. We will have another 10 years of innovation in this cycle, just moving uh, more, more, uh, more capacity, uh, better user experience, but also then linking it to the applications on top of this uh, network platform. Uh, 160 of the world's operators are now commercially with 5G. Uh, another region to mention is actually the GCC, the part of Middle East where there is very strong uh, build out and strong uptake of 5G and that's again gives them uh, a leg up, it gives them an advantage when it comes to competition with other regions because if you don't have the digital infrastructure rolled out 
then the innovation on top of the infrastructure will, will also be delayed. So that's really why governments are now looking at how can they incentivize nationwide build out of 5G faster? How can they make sure that you, you actually get access to the 5G system uh, earlier rather than later? So if we move on then, um, I think many of you are, are very familiar with this, so I, I'll, I'll be pretty brief. But what, what we are saying is that it takes significant investments in both hardware and software to to drive this technology forward. And uh, we are investing roughly 40 billion Swedish uh, in, in our annual R&D. Uh, this is uh, a big um, increase from just four years ago when we were roughly around 30 billion. So we have increased by almost one, one third, uh, more than 25% increase in R&D. And that was actually needed for us to uh, now solidly be the world leader when it comes to 5G. Um, so the, the capabilities that we have uh, gathered and, and the, the portfolio that we now have is, is really one of the main reasons why Ericsson is, is winning market share around the world, that we have so strong focus on, on the R&D. And I was delighted, John, to hear your comment about uh, the real strategy of the company comes from R&D. And uh, being uh, very solidly rooted in R&D and also wearing two hats. Maybe you know that I'm, I'm CTO, but I'm also head of Ericsson Strategy. So I, I keep the strategy and the technology very close together. But that, that is really where it comes from. This is the engine of, of growth for us. This is the engine of, of um, performance leadership and, and better user experience. And it comes out of the 26,000 roughly uh, employees in R&D, which is out of the 100,000, it's a significant part actually. Uh, and then, of course, we have a, a strong technology ownership through our patents, and, and we actually work very much in this data-driven transition that you were also into, uh, Jan, when it comes to today we manage services uh, for the operators' networks, uh, network operation centers, and, and running their networks around the world. Um, but uh, in the future, this will be through automation, leveraging the operations data, and there we really see great advancement already now, uh, being data-driven, having... Um, a large portfolio of AI use cases that are helping our customers to automate, uh, take out cost, and, and of course, create a much leaner operations uh, overall. So let's move on. Um, you can't have a CTO presentation, Jan, can you, without uh, some kind of uh, architecture? And, and I think we are uh, stubbornly holding on to uh, our architecture because we think that much of the value when we are moving from uh, sort of connectivity and, and compute being uh, separated into compute and, and uh, connectivity or networking coming closer and closer together is to really keep uh, a strong grip on the overall architecture from what we develop and, and uh, deploy in the global sites, uh, more the national sites, the distributed sites, the access site, all the way down to the devices and the local access or the local networks. And the reason for this is that Unlike uh, digitalization in, a, in an enterprise, a local enterprise, a, a data center that is, is becoming cloud, when we are doing the same journey uh, on the network infrastructure, we have to care about distance. We have to care about distribution. It really matters a lot where you execute functions. You can have huge differences in energy performance or cost of, of energy bills. You could have huge differences in terms of user experience if you run your uh, uh, XR application on the device on the network edge on the access site or if you run it in a public data center uh, in the country or perhaps even out of country. So these things uh, are really the optimization criteria that we need to, to be on top of. And that's also why when we're building the systems, uh, while they have to be modularized, um, they also have to fit into this global architecture that we can deploy basically at any site. We can deploy our applications distributed. We can deploy them centrally. We can ensure through orchestration that we have uh, fulfillment of the SLAs. We can ensure that we are resource conserving when that, that is a criteria. And of course, we can keep this together when new devices show up. So we have a very fast cycle of changing devices, whether it's uh, chipsets in IoT sensors or it's a smartphones or your XR glasses or the TV or the car, it doesn't matter what it is. The cycle of changing the technology on the device side is so fast that we need to take the responsibility to do testing across this whole end-to-end -end infrastructure. Otherwise, 
we would not be able to continue to innovate and, and drive scale at the pace that we are doing now. So it is important to keep the uh, architecture aligned. And this has now also become, you could say, the world architecture for how to standardize systems from 5G to 6G. It has also become very much the way that um, all, all networks are, are upgraded step by step from more uh, uh, bespoke monolithic systems to uh, essentially a horizontal a disaggregated architecture with openness in terms of APIs across or between the layers, but also guarantees end to end in terms of performance. And then, of course, applications on top needs to reach into this architecture with um, clear APIs and exposure functions, monetization functions. And, and of course, uh, some of these are connected to network slicing, which is a concept we um, we brought to, to standards many years ago and now is becoming commercially a reality so that any enterprise, any consumer can basically get the, the, the private or the virtual private network of their liking over one common global infrastructure. Um, so, so those are, are things that are, are really uh, planted in the architecture and of course uh, evolving with, with new standards, new open source projects and so forth. The way to extract value from this network uh, or the network platform is really to, to look at this uh, in layers and the digital infrastructure that 5G starts with, with the radio access network, the transport, the core network, the operations and business support systems, the orchestration go, goes in there and the services. With everything we do there, um, we need to build platform values that are, are easy to consume in this uh, lighter blue area in the middle here. Because many of the industries up there, we call them use cases, where there is advanced uh, gaming or entertainment cases in the consumer space, or it's uh, smart transportation, smart energy, smart uh, manufacturing, uh, all of the examples up there, they would not be able to consume 5G network services unless there was um, prepackaged solutions, unless there were uh, opportunities for them to, to basically have one neck to choke in terms of how, how do you actually modernize a factory. We have built uh, 5G factories uh, for our own purpose. So we we have 5G factories building 5G equipment. You have 5G enabled AGVs, you have 5G enabled uh, XR VR glasses, you have 5G en enabled uh, logistics flows. All of these things would not be possible to deploy on a global basis unless you had some order in this, unless you had these uh, solutions ready made. And that's really where the middle layer comes in when it comes to wireless edge solutions, when it comes to private networks, when it comes to IoT solutions, uh, network slicing, as I mentioned, but also just uh, exposing in a, a controlled way um, high performance, high speed, low latency services. What happens if you can start to order bounded latency services uh, on a regional or perhaps even global basis, when you know that the latency will not exceed, let's say, five milliseconds? Um, these are kind of guarantees that today's infrastructure has not been able to provide, but going forward, we actually see that there will be contracts towards application developers and users where they can demand more. Of course, there is a price, but they can demand more and it's anyway cheaper and better than if you have a bespoke network that you have to build for every site where you're operating or something that is, is only done at one, uh, one point. So this is really why this layer is, is important for the industry. And, and we are taking an active role to support the industry with this. So we have solutions for all of these areas, uh, acquisitions that we have made over the last year, but also own capabilities that we have built here. Then, uh, if this is really where the industry is, coming back to, to you then, Jan, and to the Software Center, you men mentioned uh, uh, Anders Kaspar, and uh, Anders has been on this journey throughout. Uh, a few things that uh, I'm very thankful for and that has helped us tremendously when it comes to collaboration, cooperation, is uh, in, in the journey that I, I now outlined. So um, this is about how we achieve speed, how we can achieve quality and, of course, effectiveness um, and the requirements in an agile context. We were early on in moving, mo moving to agile, but this also meant that uh, we had to change the way that um, we make fact-based decisions, the way we, we work with requirements. And of course, um, this becomes much more of an iterative way of working. Fast feedback loops was, was something that we learned a lot from, of course. Um, and we build products as we, we develop them. And especially, you could say, 
since this happened both on the core layer, the digital infrastructure layer, everything we do in the radio and core and orchestration and so forth, as well as in this enabling layer the, where the platform values comes in, in that middle layer, this is the, the only way, of course, to build things, but also in the core products, this, this is really the, the, the way to, to do it. That didn't um, really get us out of technical depth. I, I know everyone is, is struggling with that. Um, I think uh, not necessarily a bad thing. It means we need to, to move fast in some areas, but it's also about a structured way to learn how to identify that technical depth. And, and uh, when we quantify it and find ways to, to close it, that is really where we um, together, I think, explore new ways to, to work. Um, and um, as I mentioned, this is the fastest uh, moving technology, all categories in terms of speed of technology, speed of innovation into standards, open source and so forth. So there is, it is it's bound to be some technical depth and we just need a structured way to work with it. And of course, close uh, any of the, the more critical parts there. Um, the, the third area was, was really very connected to what you mentioned about uh, uh, data as, as a starting point for everything and, and that's ultimately giving us the right uh, uh, ability to, to make uh, automated decisions. So that changed ways of working, that changed the processes of course and uh, it's a journey. I wouldn't say that, that uh, this is anything uh, close to completed, but this has really been a fantastic journey also from that perspective. And you touched upon customer data. These networks, they have petabytes of operational data that we need to leverage to improve the products. They are also, um, to some extent, stranded data resources, because unless you can get the full transparency visibility of this data, it's, it's very difficult actually to not only improve the product, but to, to really uh, get it out in, in the first place, because uh, these are not systems that Ericsson operate, except for the cases I mentioned about managed services. These are uh, wide area networks operated by our customers. And of course, there is a data ownership, but there is also legalities and, and many other things that has to do with getting access to that data. But there's no question that that data driven development that I started to talk about, that's really the way we go. And, and MLOps is one of the, the pieces that we're working together on. And then the, the last one is obviously the whole journey of CI, CD, where I think we have a very strong way of working with our uh, development pipelines. We have a very strong buy-in from leading customers, especially in part of the portfolio that is already cloud native, already uh, well on the way here. But I have to say that this operational challenge uh, among our customer base is very significant. It has to do with uh, legacy ways of working. It has to do with uh, quality standards that have to be met. But of course, ultimately, um, they are absolutely seeing the benefit of flexibility uh, on the leading edge also when it comes to rapid upgrades to, to the system. So these are just a few of the joint work and learnings uh, that we've explored. And then I'll, uh, if you go to the next, exactly this slide, just a little bit of a glimpse of what we see for the coming uh, 10 years. Um, we believe network platforms will uh, serve society in, in profound ways. Uh, already today we see that uh, these last 15 months they have taught us that digital infrastructure is uh, a big change agent when it comes to reducing uh, emissions, uh, CO2 targets. It's a big uh, change agent when it comes to new efficient ways of working. So uh, our own estimates is that uh, uh, 5G and digital infrastructure in general will be probably the major driver in the Green Deal for example. So 15% of the reduction by 2030, that's a third of the halving that the world has put as a target would come from digital technology. So there are some very clear uh, reasons why we need to build out the infrastructure. But we look at it in these four buckets. Um, limitless connectivity is about uh, having access with high performance everywhere, indoor, outdoor, doesn't matter. Uh, this is where we talk about terahertz radios. This is where we talk about super low latency. We have the trustworthy system, which is about performance, security at all layers. Um, of course, critical national infrastructure have very high demands on, on uh, robustness, resiliency, and, and this is really the, the way to go for general networks, as well as when we talk about network slicing and other ways to, to split the network into multiple virtual networks. It's about automation and the AI journey in cognitive networks, leveraging the, the operations data, and it's about fusing of compute and um, a network in, in what we call the network compute fabric. Uh, of course, we have starting points for that today in digital twins. We, we, we see how, how this is already starting to happen. But uh, in the coming 
let's say five to ten years, these are vectors where we are continuing to drive uh, industry collaborations, where we work with universities, where we work with all kinds of partners in the ecosystem to, to really build this out as a strong business driver for, for many, many sectors. So uh, if you go to the last one, I, I just uh, want to highlight that uh, this may seem like uh, a little bit uh, long term when we talk about the platform values, but uh, we are already seeing many of these industries uh, coming on, on board. Uh, they start to see the financial value. They start to see that they cannot uh, uh, afford to, uh, to build everything on their own. They have already moved to buying compute uh, as a service. So they, they are very familiar with the cloud paradigm. Now they are moving to buy network resources as a service. And I think some of that was in your message as well, Jan. Um, but that doesn't mean that it stops with only the infrastructure. We need to work better at uh, closing the gap when it comes to API and exposure, when it comes to making these services available on a global basis. And of course, much of this is uh, automated. So the journey when it comes to AI and networks, it has started, but this is really the long-term journey that we are on as well. So that's actually why we uh, we really see this as, as the world's biggest opportunity when it comes to an innovation platform. And uh, with that, uh, thank you. And uh, over to you, Jan. Thank you very much, Eric. I really appreciate it. Um, that was an awesome presentation and you're getting claps in the audience. It's just it's a little hard to hear it because you only see, uh, see hands. Um, this was super fascinating, uh, Eric. I really appreciate it. So one of the thoughts that I had while you were presenting, because of course you are explaining a platform strategy a long time ago when we had mainframes, everything was centralized and then over time everything moved towards pro personal computers, PC, so things became highly decentralized. Then over the last, say, 10, 20 years, we've seen everything move towards the cloud, so very much a centralized approach. And the way that I'm interpreting your presentation is that we're moving towards a much more decentralized approach again, where we have to put intelligence in the places where it actually belongs, whether it's it's the end devices, the networks very close to those end devices, but we find a way of putting the optim the, the functionality in the optimal place rather than putting everything in the cloud and centralizing everything. Is that the way I should be thinking about the way that you're th you're thinking about it, or how Ericsson is thinking about taking things forward? I think it's a very good observation, and I completely agree with that. It's. Uh, in a way swinging back. You could see examples of that. We had, uh, actually I have had um, quite a lot of collaboration with our partners in the Silicon Valley ecosystem when it comes to introduction of the edge in different phases. The first phase has basically happened with public cloud and you connect it to, to, to networks. The second phase is really that you use uh, advanced resource reservations and you move workloads closer to the, the edge. That's where we have network slicing as one tool. And then the third phase is really when you start to move workloads from the devices, glasses that could be lighter, less battery, uh, less compute by moving some of that compute into the network edge. Yes. That, that means that we are, we are leveraging that edge capability because that's the best uh, place for from a performance uh, and cost perspective. But it also opens up some of those new experiences that can't be done either on the glasses or on the public cloud. So I think this is really uh, what's happening. And, and it's, it's, it's already uh, evidenced by uh, today pre-commercial, but very soon commercial uh, CE devices that are actually leveraging this. So I think you're, you're absolutely right. This is about leveraging the distribution, focusing on the performance and cost aspects while retaining much of the value of openness and open APIs and developer ecosystems, yeah. which yeah. we have learned both from the, I would say, device era as well as the public cloud era. Yeah. So it's, it's, a, it's a fusion. Yeah, and I think that's super interesting. I, I mean, I will not go into the whole political and competitive landscape, but uh, there are some people on this side of the Atlantic that are somewhat concerned about the dominance of certain centralized cloud players, and I think that this is a very viable alternative for that. Um, I am not quite sure if I can see the chat seems to be muted. I wanted to see if there's anyone who can who has a question to Eric before we uh, wrap it, uh, before we have to wrap this up. 
but I can see that the meeting chat is not open. So, but I think that people that are not on YouTube but on the uh, Teams meeting, you can basically unmute and uh, ask a question to Eric uh, before we thank him and let him go. Anyone who wants to go? That is, they can unmute, right? <laughs> okay. Anyone who wants to raise a hand? Uh, uh, th thank you very much for the great uh, presentation. It's really uh, great to see the insights. Uh, I would like to ask you about uh, further future. Now we can see more and more like uh, notes about uh, 6G. Uh, uh, so if you could say something about uh, uh, what is the strategy and what are the plans related to 6G and what, what is the, uh, the, uh, the, the biggest difference between 5G and 6G? Thanks for, for the question. <clears throat> uh, many of you know that uh, uh, when we talk about uh, G's, 3G, 4G, 5G, it's typically a 10-year cycle. And the reason for that is that this, it takes some time to recoup the investments from the previous generation, and it also takes some time to mature the technology. And this is true both on the hardware side as well as on the software side. So that's why we are planning for a 6G introduction in around 10 years' time. It could be a little bit earlier, but, but it's, it's basically that cycle that we talk about. And that means that now we are... Uh, very actively uh, working with partners such as leading universities, uh, actually leading competitors as well, because this is very pre-competitive. And uh, we have taken initiatives to, to drive 60 research. In Europe, we call it HEXA-X. Uh, we have activities in, in North America and Northeast Asia, many places around the world where we are now actively working with the ecosystem to start with um, capabilities, start with, with uh, if you like, visions and, and, and requirements, and over time then mature that research into to standards and, and, and deployments. But some of the things that have come up already now, to, to your point of what is different, is that as you start to weave this fabric for society, uh, the, there is no real end in terms of how demanding a society will be because if we talk about person-to-person -person communication we know that there is some uh, limits in terms of how low latency we, we require there are some practical limits in terms of how much bandwidth you can consume but when you look at uh, advanced digital twins connecting or ai connecting to ai you, you talk about machines at both ends you talk about something that has to work on a global basis then there are no such limits so here we talk about even higher rates, we talk about even lower latencies just to support that kind of connection between the physical and, uh, uh, and the digital world. Um, and that's where, where some of the, the research is, is directed. But then you can also see that this uh, fabric uh, has the capability to support society in other ways, whether it's in sensing, and there you use really high frequencies. We talk about terahertz radios, I mentioned that. Um, but it's also when, when you go to those kind of things, you can support in many other ways. You, you could have um, advanced weather control, that you, you start to expand the use cases beyond uh, communication, beyond the applications that we can imagine today. So we are very active working with uh, the broader ecosystem on what are those driving needs, the driving use cases, the driving applications that Ericsson will not uh, invent. We will, we will be the enabler for that. So we are really uh, taking an active role in providing test beds to um, partners, startups, uh, universities, and others, so that they can experiment. And one of the ways that we're doing that, uh, actually in Sweden, but we do it in, in other places around the world, our D15 lab in Santa Clara is one such example. So their uh, innovators are invited to come with their best uh, ideas and, and, and sort of push 5G. When 5G breaks or when 5G doesn't uh, cut it, that, that's where we kind of take take over and, and make sure that that is covered by 60. So it's, it's going to be a gradual gradual learning in terms of what 60 needs to be, uh, but we have already put in place, I think, much of the infrastructure for it in terms of research and, and partnerships and so forth. Very good. Thank you very much, Eric. Uh, there is one question by Emily. We are starting to run out of time. Uh, so Emily, if I hope it's a short question and also a short answer for, <laughs> for Eric, because I want to re be respectful of Eric's time as well. So Emily, go ahead. I just wanted to pick up on what you said about technical debt. Uh, that it's inevitable and necessary, I agree. 
Um, but we need to find ways to quantify and close it. Great, yes. Yep. And strictly structured ways. Can you say anything more about what kind of structured ways you, you mean? 3G is not going away. I mean, what are you doing with this? Ah, okay. But I, I think that there are perhaps good examples of what I mentioned and, and not so good examples. I, I think that technical depth uh, that I was talking about happens also in new development for the latest technology. You need to be mindful about how you, you treat that technical depth. And that's where I think we can be structured. When it comes to legacy in general, and this is true for networks and IT, I assume it's true for the automotive industry, transport industry as well and so forth, then you, you have to make a very clear uh, conscious decision that we, we are not going to uh, handle all the legacy. We have to put a stop to that and of course shield to, to a, a large extent uh, some of that legacy from from new requirements and, 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 and full upgrades. That is simply not possible. We, we are moving too fast to, to do all of that. Uh, security is a different space. There you have to take that responsibility. But I think in many other areas, you simply need to leave the legacy at some point. Yeah. Good. Now, with that, we are running out of time. And I know that there are some questions in the chat, but unfortunately, we do not have time for that. Eric, I want to thank you once more for uh, taking the time to give this wonderful presentation. Really insightful, very exciting to see the platform journey that is happening. There is a small token of our appreciation coming your way. I was looking if I could find the instance, but you're going to get a software center hoodie from us, which I hope ah. you wear proudly uh, in, different, uh, in different situations. Uh, but once again, thank you so much for taking the time, and I really appreciate uh, that you were willing to give the presentation. So thanks once again. And for everyone else, we're now switching towards the different breakout uh, groups and communities. So please look at the schedule and switch to the right Teams channel uh, for the next thing. But Eric, thanks a lot. Thanks, and, John. Uh, thanks. And thanks we'll to all of you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thank Bye. you.